everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael Vigiel, and I would like to welcome you to my channel today. Um, I have a special guest, uh, Harry, Gary Hughes from Orlando. Um, he doesn't really need much introduction. Everyone who is in that industry probably know him really well. I've been a big fan of your work, of your teaching, um, pretty much everything what you do. So thank you for invite. Well, for accepting this invitation. I know you're a busy guy. You've got a lot of stuff going on right now, but thank you for finding the time and talk to me. So appreciate it. No problem. It. I'm glad we could do it. I just want to comment. I also am a big, a big fan of your work and I, I'm a big fan of that intro that we just played. Oh. I was just sitting here like, dun, 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 dun. That was, oh, thank you. I feel, I feel energized by that. That's great. No, I, uh, you know I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. And, you know, speaking of that intro, I'll tell you a little funny about this because I was trying to find something which could just kind of showcase what I do. And then I would have something for starting my YouTube. And I found this person on Fiverr and she's like, well, I can do some nice intro for you. I paid hundred bucks for it. And then friend of mine told me what software she used. And he literally took like 10 minutes to do it and you can do it. For I know free. it's such a bummer because I've used Fiverr so much. And then when you get oh. into the video editing stuff and you realize that they're all just using plugins and templates that you could have easily Absolutely. done yourself, you know, it's, but you know what? Kudos like yes. fine. You got me. Keep the hundred bucks. <laughs> I learned my dad always said when any, when anything happens like that to me, my dad gave me a piece of advice a long time ago. And he said, um, son, you learned a very expensive lesson for a very cheap price. So a yes. hundred bucks is a lesson. You, you learned a lesson for a hundred bucks. Thank God it wasn't more. And yes, now you absolutely. won't make that mistake again. You know? Yes. So I, 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 I it always rings true with me when, when, when I get ripped off and it's a survivable amount of money, I just think I learned an expensive lesson for a cheap price. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. But yeah, again, it was kind of interesting because this whole thing happened at the same time and you just like, you know what, this is the lesson I wish I could learn before or someone who just <laughs> give, you know, me this advice 24 hours prior, it would be completely different. But well, <laughs> yeah, like you said, it's a good lesson. This is why um, people crowdsource things on Facebook. They before they buy anything, they're like, what do you all think or whatever? Yeah, you know, exactly. Yes, for sure. Um, so, you know what? I have tons of questions for you, um, but let's start from the kind of beginning if you could just tell me how your photography career started and how you even got into this you know uh, photography business but also what i would like to know why you choose shooting headshots because this is really kind of unique kind of um you know yeah i mean i'm happy industry. to i'm happy to talk about it buckle up because it's a long sure. story no i'm okay. just kidding it's not the <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 short version is that my parents were professional photographers and okay. they retired a few years back. They closed their studio and retired a few years ago. And me and all my siblings, we all worked in the studio. And this was back shooting medium format film. They were a wedding and portrait studio. And it's funny when I think about it now, when I was eight years old, my first job uh, in my dad's studio, because I was there all the time after school or whatever, you know, and was developing headshots black and white reproductions in you know with an enlarger and in developer developing fluid and fixer and and he taught me how to develop uh, black and white film shooting headshots and because but back then headshots was really headshots were just something that only very important people got done so if somebody was going to have a this would this would have been in the 80s you know and somebody was going to be on a billboard or they had an article coming out in a magazine or something like that, like people didn't just go and get headshots. And so that would come back later. But when your parents do something and they're known for something, you're either going to follow them in their footsteps. Like if your dad's a cop or, or you're, you know, or you're, or you're, or you're whatever, your mom's a firefighter and you're going to do that, or you're just going to go running in the other direction. I use the example of, of a pastor or a preacher. That's always like, if you're the pastor's kid, you're either going to follow your follow your dad into the ministry, or you're going to be the worst kid. <laughs> like there's almost no in between. And so I, um, I didn't. I, I, I once I was old enough, I moved away from home to go to college, and I wanted nothing to do with photography ever, ever again. Because my life as a child was like 
putting together proof books until your fingers bleed and assisting on weddings and carrying bags and eventually doing, you know, video second camera, video first camera by, by the time I was like 16 or 17. And, uh, you know, I, I went to school for sociology. I got a degree in criminal sociology, but I ended up leaving after school and becoming a musician. I did that for a couple of years. And then I worked in construction and, uh, you know, I've been a janitor, I've been a, a server, I've been, I've done a, a bunch of different things. I even worked at IHOP for one day. I worked at oh, IHOP wow. because <laughs> yeah, I like pancakes, but anyway, I worked at IHOP for a day. and, uh, it wasn't until I got, I went back to school later on after I, my, my partner, Chris and I, we sold our construction business mm -hmm. in 2005, right before the, the global economic meltdown that was fueled by the housing market. Mm -hmm. And I went back to school cause I was like, I, I, what about computers? People like computers. And so I went back to school for that. And then I got a job repairing computers and networking for circuit city in their computer repair department not as quite as prestigious as the geek squad that best buy has but i um i bought a digital rebel i at on a black friday sale and this would have probably been 2006 or 2007 mm -hmm. And not even the cool one. It was like the, the gray one. And I really wanted the black one, but they were all out of the black one. And I started taking pictures for fun, which is something I had never done before. I took pictures of my girlfriend. I took pictures of my friends. I took pictures at parties and just carried this stupid little camera, which, which took great photos, by the way. I just carried this little camera. I was just the guy with a camera. And so I started sending some of my pictures to my mom and dad to show them that I was taking pictures. And then immediately, you know, they were like, oh, he's going to be a photographer now, which wasn't even on my radar. But eventually I got kind of sucked into it. So I started driving down from Orlando to where I grew up in Stewart, Florida, which is sort of mm -hmm. on the East Coast, uh, north of West Palm Beach, where their studio was and working in their studio on the weekends. And that was my job. So I'd work all week and then I'd leave Friday and I'd go down to their studio. I'd work Saturday and Sunday, drive home Sunday night. And that was when I started working in their business because I wanted to, because I mm -hmm. anything I'm good at, or show a, a, an aptitude for, I try to turn it into profit. That's just sort of mm -hmm. how I'm wired. I think a lot of photographers are like that. Some photographers are artists who want to enjoy their job. And some people are just entrepreneurs who picked up a camera. And I'm an entrepreneur who picked up a camera. And mm -hmm. so I did that. I would work on the weekends. And then what I realized is, is I didn't really want to work in a business like the one they had. There's nothing wrong with their business. But the mm -hmm. way I, I didn't want that to be my photography business. So I talked to them about it. And they recommended me to a photographer in Orlando, and his name is Kurt Littlecott, and he's no longer in the area. But he was really the first photographer who, when I, I started to apprentice with him in his studio, carrying his bags and stuff. And he's an incredible artist. And I really started to, to learn photography then. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple of years. Then I met my wife and we sort of got hit it off and she was into photography as well. And then we started our business together after six months of dating. We went oh, into wow. business together. Yeah, I know we, before we were married, we were in business together and our parents were not crazy about that idea at all. You know, they were not fans. Like, what are you doing? What's going to happen when it doesn't work out with you guys or whatever. But we mm -hmm. knew, you know, we've been married 10 years now. We've been together for 15 and eventually what happened was is we created a portrait and wedding studio because which is what most people do and uh, most photographers they come in weddings are pretty accessible they're easy to get into if you've got a camera and you're willing to do it for cheap somebody will let you shoot their wedding and that's kind of how we started mm -hmm. and my wife had a friend who was an actor and she was in a movie called Sydney white which is like a college movie i think it was starring amanda Bynes, and it was filmed here in orlando on campus at ucf the university of central florida and she needed new headshots. And so she asked us if we could do it. And my wife actually is the one who went and shot the photos. I didn't actually take the photos. Then she introduced us to her agent and we started that relationship there. And then they started to send people our way. And then it just sort of headshots became a thing that we started to do. Mm -hmm. and, and little by little, it started to take over our business, not necessarily the actors, although I still shoot a lot of actors. What happened was, is because I have an IT background and I understand the internet and stuff like that, I are, are built a website and we were the first headshot studio, the first photography studio to do online proofing in our area. We were the first studio 
instead of contact sheets. We were the first studio to do a lot of things that related to digital because I was always really sort of technology forward. And that gave us an advantage even when the work wasn't great. Mm -hmm. And so people wanted to work with us because we were easy to work with. And so we got the word of mouth started to go. But what happened is the, the, the SEO started to build. And mm -hmm. so when you started looking for headshots in Orlando, it wasn't just actors that were searching for that. This was at the time when social media was taking off, LinkedIn hit, Facebook opened to everybody. And all of a sudden, everyone needed a professional headshot. Uh, and that was spreading like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And people started to look online for headshots and they would find us. And even though we were really looking for actors, I started to get inquiries. And I remember very clearly one day I got a phone call on the company phone. And a guy said, do you guys uh, photograph anybody who's not young and good looking? <laughs> and then I was like, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Absolutely. And he's like, good. I need a headshot for my law firm. And I remember the feeling of like, you can feel all the synapses firing and neurons and it just burned a trace across my brain. <laughs> and I was like, what have we been doing this entire time? Go outside and look around at every building, at every house, at every apartment. And in there is a person who needs a professional headshot. And I had been chasing the small actors market, a bunch of broke ass actors, <laughs> you know, and, and, and when I had a whole bunch of like day traders and lawyers and hedge fund managers and accountants and realtors, and they all need headshots and they all have jobs. And like, why am I ignoring all these people? And I saw around that same time, I saw a presentation given by one of my friends and photography mentors. He's a photographer from, Ta from Tampa named Kevin Newsom. And he mm -hmm. had been doing this for a while. He's a clever old fox, man. He gets around and he pivots his business as much as he needs to. And he gave a presentation on professional headshots at our local PPA affiliate. And those kind of things were happening at the same time. And all of a sudden it was like, and we just became... Mark started marketing for professional headshots, corporate headshots. And at that time, you know, we were starting to really look at the numbers in our business and we looked at weddings and portraits and everything else we did. And we were spending 80% of our, of our marketing budget and time marketing on weddings and portraits. And it was only bringing in 40% of our business. And then we looked at our photography, headshot photography, and we were spending about 20% of our, effort marketing headshot photography and it had grown to 60 percent of our business about thereabout mm -hmm. and so right then and there in the room we're like we're dumping everything else and over the process of the next few years we went from being a full service anything you need studio say yes to everything mm -hmm. to being what we now call a commercial portrait studio so i take pictures of people and uh, for their jobs, I take pictures for brands. I don't take pictures for individuals. So you need a picture of yourself with your birthday balloons because you just turned 21. I don't do that. You mm -hmm. need pictures because you're a model who's looking to work. I do that. You need pictures because you're a lawyer. I, I do that. You need brand photos that you're submitting to Forbes magazine. I do that. You need pictures of babies in a bucket. I don't do that. You need, unless that baby in a bucket is for a marketing campaign, and then I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, I don't do it. Really? No dragging couches into fields of, of lilies or anything like that. I just, I Monday through Friday, I photograph 90% of my business is photographing people's heads and shoulders. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we're, and we're busy. We're bu uh, right now we're busier than we've ever been. It's the more we specialized, the busier we got, which was crazy. And I know that's not every market, not every photographer at every market can do that because, because I'm in a large city, but, um, man, it is amazing what specializing has done, really focusing on that and having something very specific to market for and something very specific to refine. And it, it's just been, it's just been excellent. And I don't work nights and weekends, which is really the best part. Well, you have a beautiful family, which also needs attention, right? And this is also yes. what, what, what kind of drove me into headshots because I kind of coming from the same background. I started with weddings, then this whole thing started getting overwhelming. And I really needed something more specialized, something where I can control better. Um, and that's how I turn into. So kind of similar approach, um, but the specializing you know, part is, again, is extremely important. And I 100% agree with you. Well, okay, your so son and my oldest daughter are the same age, right? They're both seven, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's kind of, yeah, 
same the same process and you know this whole wedding thing was just i don't know how you felt about it but uh, for me it started being so like tiring and i was to, i used to do lots of destination weddings so i was just you know out yeah. for a week couple weeks i'm not anti-wedding Rafael, no, no, I'm no, not no. anti-wedding. No, but but like because I had one and it was fine. But I did wedding photography. I was going to weddings from the age of eleven. You know, I, okay. I've okay. I've personally photographed six hundred weddings, and I've and I've worked at more than a thousand. So I've done my time in the wedding industry. But I love shooting weddings. Uh, I, it's challenging. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Yeah, you know, and it has its problems. Lord knows, wedding weddings have have their issues, and they're very high stress, which isn't good for me. I'm a high strung person, and I tend to dread a wedding, like starting four or five days before the wedding. I'm just like, I start to get weird anxiety, you know, and like, and I don't calm down at a wedding until I've got my first few good shots. Like once I get to the wedding, and normally you're in the bride's getting ready room, right? And I'll and I'll dick her around and I'll shoot the shoes and I'll shoot the rings or whatever it is. I shoot the dress hanging from a thing on the wall or whatever. And then once I get my first few portraits like that are really good, then I go, Oh yeah, I still, I still know how to do this. Yeah. But that, yeah. the, the toll of that anxiety, but there are people who shoot weddings who don't feel that way, who enjoy it, mm -hmm. who look forward to it. I know a guy in my area and I send all wedding inquiries to him because it's like, you want the most enthusiastic, son of a bitch you're ever going to meet like this is your guy he's going to be so happy to be at your wedding and you're just he's your guy but um yeah but but for mainly from the family aspect of things i we really started to get out of the wedding business when my wife became pregnant with our first and i remember being a kid a child of wedding photographers and, and i love and, and admire my parents for their business and what they did for 35 years in the business but i don't want to miss volleyball practice i don't want to miss soccer games or cub scout retreats or mm -hmm. you know i don't want to and wedding photographers it's nights and weekends all your meetings and sales appointments are in the evenings after the client gets off work and all of your you know your weddings are on saturdays and sundays for the most part and i didn't want to be gone mm -hmm. and so we decided to that was one of the things that led to us deciding to getting out of the wedding business. Um, I, I enjoyed doing it. I was always proud when I walked back to the, nothing feels better than walking to the car with your gear. When you're leaving a wedding, knowing that yeah. you nailed it, you know, you know, and oh, you're absolutely. just like, and that's a great feeling. And I, I admire wedding photographers, some of the best photographers in the world, but like I changed my business to suit the lifestyle I wanted. And my lifestyle was changing because I was becoming a father and yeah. So we changed our business because we want a certain kind of life and wedding photography would not give us that life. Absolutely. But also what I think, and this is again, my, I think you have the same experience. I think the wedding photography and being in that industry kind of prepare you for any type of photography you're doing, because like, oh, I, yeah. I remember, you know, the, when it comes to wedding, you, you have to learn how to act quickly, how to solve problems on the spot, how oh, to yes. work different lighting. So then when you're jumping into any other type of photography like you have all this not only the technical skills but also how to you know deal with all sorts of problems because that's another thing because photography like it's constantly you know solving the problems right but weddings teach you how to do this quickly like right on the spot, yes you know, oh well, yeah and i think that that's going to feed into what a lot of what we're going to end up talking about which is my volume work but you know you know you want to know who the who the the most relaxed person you're ever going to meet is the most unflappable person you'll ever meet is someone who was a fighter pilot in a war. Like if that person can go screaming at Mach 2 with like, you know, ordnance exploding around their plane, dropping bombs, flying low, flying, but like that person, do you think that like in line at the supermarket, that guy's going to be bothered by, you know, somebody who writes a check and is taking too long. Now there's, there's just nothing you can do to bother a, a good fighter pilot with combat experience. And, and, and I really believe that wedding photographers, that's the closest analogy I can think of. Cause you're just through the fire constantly with people at you. You're being pulled in six different directions. You, the, the circumstances are completely out of your control and you learn to do so much so quickly. Yeah. And, and I think that every photographer should spend a couple of years, if just not shooting. running a wedding business, but just second shooting. 
you know, just go, go shoot a hundred weddings before you do any other type of photography, you should go shoot a hundred weddings. Thanks. And if you can, and if you can be <laughs> calm at a wedding, there is nothing that's going to really stress you out too bad. Like I totally agree. Yeah. So let's jump into, you know, more technical questions. And even though we have kind of the same approach to the gear, but let's talk a little bit about, about equipment. Like what's, what kind of setup you have, um, we've discussed before we start even this interview about our similar kind of way of, you know, looking at the equipment. Um, so let's kind of dive into this and let's kind of unpack this whole gear thing. Oh, yeah, we got to have we got to talk about gear or there are, there are some people that are going to be upset with you, I think. That's, and me. that's, you know, that's the deal. Have... So let's run <laughs> quickly through it. So, you know, they're not going to be upset with me. But um, yeah, let's let's kind of <laughs> jump sure. in a little bit into this. Uh, I guess to start with. I would say that you approach gear differently. If photography is your full-time job, uh, that's a completely different approach than if photography is your hobby. If you're spending your extra money on photography gear, money that you set aside for your own enjoyment, then buy whatever the hell you want. Who cares? You know, If you are running a photography business, you have to put a budget in place based on how much you expect to earn and say, I'm going to spend, well, let's say that you've got a business and you're going to, let's just use round numbers. Let's say you're going to gross a hundred thousand dollars from your photography business. And you go, okay, then I've got out of that hundred thousand dollar gross, $5,000 is my gear budget for the year. And that's not a bad gear budget actually for if you, if you've got stuff already, $5,000 for upgrades and maintenance isn't a terribly, you know, isn't, isn't that bad of a budget. So like, and you got to stick to it. Like you have to budget for gear. You have to mm -hmm. understand what percentage of your income should be spent on equipment. And so, uh, and every decision has to be a financial one. Mm -hmm. And so it, when you're running a business, you don't just buy something because you want it. If you think like, you know, there's a company, Westcott just came out with a new product that I really want. And, uh, but I have the previous version of it. And unfortunately for Westcott, it still works really, really well. And it's been served. I've had this thing for like 10 years. Have you, mm. you, you ever used the X drop background from, from Westcott? No. I got this X. Oh, it's just like a fabric that puts up over okay. an X frame and super portable goes, folds up to the size of about a party sub. And it gives you like a five foot by seven foot white background that you could just take anywhere. It's brilliant. And um, I've had this thing for almost 10 years and it still works. It hasn't mm -hmm. broken. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not like a computer that will eventually die on you. Like this thing is just, just keeps on trucking. And so I'm not going to buy that new one because I have the old one, mm -hmm. you know? And so if I were to buy a, a replacement, it would have to be like, is this going to save me money? Or is this going to save me time? Or is it going to make me more money? And the mm -hmm. answer to those three questions are no, no, no. And the fourth question, which is the least important question if you're running a business, is this piece of gear going to improve the quality of my work? And that is a consideration, but that's the easiest one to say yes to. And so that should be the last line of defense when spending money. Is it going to save me time? Is it going to save me money? Is it going to make me money? And then ask yourself, is it going to improve my work? And does my work need improving as far as, is it going to help me sell my work better? Because that's still like a, is it going to make more money? Does my work, is it going to improve my work as an artist's question, not a business person's question? And are you able to sell your work at market price or above that you're doing it right now? Then you don't need to improve your work. I mean, you should always be trying, but you need to spend money to improve your work. So like my gear setup is pretty simple. I use all Flashpoint, that's Adorama's version of Godox lighting. All of my lights are Flashpoint lights. Um, and I use most of the glow soft boxes for my strip lights and my main soft box. That's the Adorama brand. And I get that all, and that's basically all Godox stuff. And I buy it through Adorama because it's, you can service their, they will service the warranty in the United States instead of having to deal with Godox directly and their service and support in China. And so nothing against China, just that it's a little easier to deal with Adorama um, for me living in Florida. Yeah. And so, um, and then I have a bunch of seamless paper backgrounds and I have a few nice, can you know, painted canvas backgrounds I've collected over the years. And uh, I use a lot of umbrellas, like mm -hmm. they're cheap, you know, uh, and that's, 
pretty much what I use. My camera is the the Canon R5, and I have a my backup camera is the Canon RP, which is like an eight hundred dollar camera, and I uh, and and that's pretty much that's pretty much most of my gear. And I the reason I use the Godox stuff is there are better lights. In fact, there are much better lights in most cases. Lights that are prettier that fire more consistently that um maybe the battery lasts longer i don't know I, th it all seems pretty relative to me but i as a business decision i would love to have a studio full of ellen crom or pro photo lights because they're just or brown color or something because they're just they, they're beautiful you know but if these lights do more than enough and i need them to do they've never failed to do their job for me they're robust there are better lights and there are cheaper lights than the Godox lights, but I don't think that there are any better lights for less. I think they're the best value lighting product, and so I use those. And before that, up until I bought every all my my flashpoint lighting for the studio, I was using Alien Bees and photogenic lights that were given to me. And now I'm, I'm not kidding. That was for ten years. I used lights, donated lights, to run my business. And the only lights I ever bought were I had a couple of Canon speed lights. And I was using those for all my location work. So like I ran a business for 10 years with two speed lights and a bunch of borrowed studio strobes that were like 10 years old. So, you know, it, it's, and I ran a successful business during that time. So I think that there's a temptation to have the newest and greatest thing and to have everything shiny. And I finally have mostly everything in my studio is new. I have all matching beautiful C stands. I purchased proper light stands. I've got all this nice gear in my studio that's nice and clean and new and shiny, but I didn't spend money on anything like that until I'd been in business for 11 years and I earned it and I set the money aside to be able to buy it. And I didn't go into debt for any of that gear. I, w I waited until I could buy it until it was in the budget, until I had grown my business to a size that was in the budget. And over that entire time, I've been able to pay myself a paycheck every single week because I haven't been spending all my money on gear that's basically where i'm at with the gear you should write a book and it should be mandatory for every photographer <laughs> who's getting into this industry honestly because that's one of the biggest i think myths right and in, in this industry that you know the it's gear frustrating it's frustrating yeah, it. but also i think you know the the problem is that those manufacturers you know they also want to make money right so they do everything with their power to put their equipment and sell their equipment into photographers hands um but I think this whole thing just went too far, in my opinion. And photographers, you know, they take this way too seriously and they believe some of those myths that, you know, better camera or better lighting is going to make you better photographer. Are people shocked to find out from you that you've been shooting with old speed lights this entire time? Like the work that you get is just a couple of old speed lights. And do does that blow people away? They're like, what are you using? And you're like, yes, I just got oh, a absolutely. Of old speed uh, absolutely and then the thing is that those I, again i've been i've been using those lights for decades they don't want to break on me to be honest because i was planning to go in with those in flashpoints as well but i'm like i'll wait till they break and to be honest you know they fall they they went through hell yeah. and they good, still good gear is tough to kill you <laughs> yeah, know exactly. it should be you know uh, yeah i, I I think that I'm not against new gear because here's the flip side of that. Here's the other side of that coin is that a new piece of gear can also invigorate your creativity. And I think that that's important, you know, cause you know, you get things like the, the Lindsay Adler and Westcott came out with the optical spot mm -hmm. thing. And that's cool. And that, you know, things like that have been around a long time, but maybe not in such a simple all inclusive package like that. Um, and, and you get something like that, for example, and you're like, able to do things that you weren't able to do before and you can get creative and shooting creatively and, and expanding creativity can really invigorate your energy to attack what you do for your business. And so, you know, I'll do personal shoots from time to time and I'll bring in clients and I'll hire models and I'll just create stuff that I want to create. And when I go into the following week, back to my normal routine, shooting client headshots, like I feel like reinvigorated by that. So mm -hmm. it's almost like when you're a kid and you got a new pair of tennis shoes and then you're like look mom i can run faster like, no you can't <laughs> but you feel like you can yeah. and so sometimes new gear can make you feel like you can do more and maybe it can actually make you do more so you do have to balance it but again 
is if you create a budget, uh, create a budget for equipment and then don't exceed it. And then just feel free, guilt-free, play guilt-free inside that budget. And if you want a new MacBook Pro and it's in the budget, you you buy it. You buy it, babe. You buy it. You want a, you want a new lens? It's in the budget. Doll, you just do it. Yeah, you do it, Bubba. Get yourself that new lens. Like, whatever. Like, just, you just have to be smart. Like, do you want to, are you running a business just so that you can fuel your hobby? Because in that case, you know what fuels a hobby better than a poorly run business? A really good job with photography as a hobby. Another job that's not photography. So like, yeah, you definitely don't need it. And there are so many photographers that will just lie. I, one of the best photographers I know in my area, he's been using the Nikon like D750 since it came mm -hmm. out. And he just got rid of it. And, and, you know, just, and he's creating work that like people are like, Ooh, what are you using? Like a Z nine. He's like, no, I just got this old D seven fifty. I just been kicking the crap out of it for 12 years yeah. or whatever. So, you know, uh, agreed gear isn't everything fundamentals are, but just, just to hammer home the point that gear, you have to approach gear completely differently when you're running a photography business versus when yeah. photography is your hobby and you have some other source of income. And it's not always a bad thing to buy new gear, but, Budget. Ask Budget. yourself, is it going to save me time? Is it going to make me money? You know, uh, is it going to save me money? And then potentially, is it going to improve the quality of my work? And those are the four things you need to ask. And really, you need to have at least two of those in order to authorize purchasing a piece of new equipment, unless it's to replace something that you've broken. And uh, that's what insurance is for. Yes, absolutely. I'm still shooting my Nikon D800, which is also beat up to hell. But you know yeah, what? It's a great also, camera. It is. And and even I think when this camera breaks, I'm not going to go further than, you know, D850, you know, but um, still it's kicking around. You're probably you break. probably got a, like something crazy, like a retirement fund. You know, you're probably yes. putting away money. For, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, you can tell I'm like, eight, you know, <laughs> photographers that are going to retire don't have the newest and greatest equipment. That's, uh, that's, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So let's, uh, this is the kind of the, the main, maybe not the main point I want to talk to you, but I want to kind of unpack your high volume uh, gigs because, you know, I, I, How much I've been in this industry <laughs> for <laughs> industry for a decade and the biggest, um, you know, photo shoot I had was about 60 people. I never ever. That's a, that's shot. a lot of headshots. It is. Um, but I like to spend time with my clients. I, you know, I like to kind of get know them a little bit. I, I want to kind of, you know, find the best angles that there, there, there's a lot of kind of, but with those high volume ones, it's a little bit of different approach. And I want to talk it. I want to talk to you about it because you've done some huge events. You've shot, like, I don't know what was the biggest one. And then we, maybe we can talk about uh, it a little bit later. Gosh, the, probably the biggest one I ever shot was maybe 1500 people in two days. Yeah. That was about the biggest one I've ever shot. Wow. So what's your approach? Like how you approach this whole thing? Is there like kind of a specific strategy you have? Um, because, you know, like, I'm guessing you don't have much time with each individual. It's kind of in and no. out. No, uh -uh. I know. Uh, well, honestly, Raffle, it's like it's it's more like a magic show than anything okay. else. You know, like <laughs> I get about sixty seconds to two and a half minutes, depending on the event. You know, uh, event uh, headshot photography, volume headshot photography. Let me see how I want to break this down. It breaks down into basically like three categories, mm -hmm. and one of those categories has two subcategories the first category is small teams and almost everybody who shoots headshots has done this anyone from like three to maybe 12 to 15 people and you're doing headshots for like a small law office or something yes. and, th and those are great gigs man those are like mwah, chef's kiss those are really great it's good money um yeah, they're they're not com not very difficult to accomplish and you know you get a little more time with each person and you're able to give really great service. And th that's great. So small teams. Let's put that over here. And then we're going to go. The next is going to be medium teams to large teams. And medium teams uh, to me is like 25 to 50. And 25 to 50, that medium sized team, that's going to be a little more like a production line. So you're dealing with companies that are 
reaching that large company status. And, you know, anything above 50 people you're getting into legal, legally speaking, you're getting into a no longer a small business. And so this is to me, medium sized teams are really the sweet spot for headshot photographers, especially if you do a little bit of volume because they rarely want anything more than one retouched image per person in my experience they it's usually pretty simple they almost always want white or gray you know or something to that effect and you know they like they want it to be done efficiently the main thing they're looking for is consistency each in individual person wants to have a great shot of themselves but the person who hired you is your client not all these employees that you're photographing and what they want is you to make their life easier. They want to get this project done and then they want to go back to their life. And so uh, what's great about it is that you, you, you're not expected to spend 20 or 30 minutes with each person. In fact, they would hate that in a lot of cases because that's just taken way too long. That was, you know, it's going to take you like a, a full work week to shoot 50 people if you do that, you know? So essentially this is where you start to get into a little more of the production line stuff where we will mm -hmm. shoot, but we almost always, for the sake of efficiency, have them selecting their images on site. So we'll shoot tethered, and then they will see the images right away. We show them, let's say, anywhere between four or six options from what we shot. And then we'll have an assistant, and they will go, which one do you want? I think that one's great. And then they'll go, you know what? That one is great. Good. That's your image. Thanks. <laughs> and then we retouch that one image per person, and we send them over to the company. And now these are great because these are the jobs where I'll make two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 in a few hours you know a lot of times you do these jobs in the morning so i'll show up i'll roll up at eight o'clock we'll start shooting at nine and i'll shoot 50 people and i'll be out of there by like 12 or one o'clock and so mm -hmm. and and we charge per person and each person gets a retouched image they select the images on site so by and large when i'm breaking down my gear i am uploading the images to my editor so like mm -hmm. they're i'm done like i don't even take them back to the studio and process them because i usually process them as I'm shooting, creating a, a custom preset for each job and they pick the images and then I export the JPEG, send them to the editor and they're uploading as I'm packing up my gear. So I walk off the job with my part of it done, which is great. And then my assistant follows up from there, downloads the images from the editor and delivers the bond to the client. Mm -hmm. Now, the third category is going to be um, event-based headshots now i'm not going to talk about large teams which is mm -hmm. companies over 50 people because i don't think practically speaking although you will get some jobs like this i don't think practically speaking that companies that large bring in a photographer to photograph everybody as much as you think they do there's a reason that you're not getting jobs where you're shooting 100 at 150 people for a company in your area now i'm not saying they don't happen they do but they don't happen nearly as much as small and medium teams do mm -hmm. not because there aren't big companies but because it is too much of a pain in the butt for a large company with 400 employees to get everybody a consistent headshot. It would be cheaper for them to just hire somebody to just be the headshot photographer and to go to the office every day to photograph all of the new hires that they have because there's a turnover. And then they'll never have a, a consistent headshot for everybody. And then you'd have to have somebody at the company who all they did was coordinate headshots for people. And it would just be a, it would just be a nightmare. So by and large, companies that are that size, more than likely, they will just say, you need to get a headshot on a white background and then bring the receipt in and we'll reimburse you for it. File an expense for it. So if it's like a law, I photograph for a lot of law firms and the big law firms are almost always that way. They're like, here, here's what the CEO's headshot looks like. Go find, get one that looks as much like that as you can turn in an expense report to cover it. We'll pay, we'll reimburse you for the headshot. So they don't typically have a dedicated photographer that comes out and does that because of the turnover problem, because what they're doing is creating a ton of work for themselves. In, in most cases, in fact, a friend of mine actually does this for a local aerospace engineering company. He is the staff photographer for this large company and he does all the headshots. <laughs> he does that and he covers their like the any internal events and stuff. He does like event photography for them. But by and large, he's shooting just shooting headshots all week long of people who work for this company. And so, you know, uh, I don't think that going after companies that large is particularly worthwhile they do exist and they will come your way from time to time but for the most part they don't use a headshot photographer in the way we think they do 
Um, and I think that oh, some do, but not a lot. In fact, you may get a local branch of a very large company that has decided to use one photographer, but only only a maybe a 10, 12 times in my entire career have I been brought in to photograph three, 400 people at a local company in my area. They usually just don't do headshots that way. They just don't. They give it, they leave it up to the employee to go get their own. And that's just sort of how I see it. Like I photograph for Staples and, you know, a bunch of other companies, but it's very rare. Uh, mostly media, medium companies are like the main concentration for where the money is now. So we're going to leave large companies out of it because mm -hmm. I don't think it's, and I think it's the least viable of these three categories. So the third thing is event based headshots. And this is where you can make a good amount of money, but this is where you're shooting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. So the exception for large companies is like this. So when large companies will pay one person, to come and photograph their entire sales team or whatever is when they're having their annual sales meeting or something similar like that, when everybody's going to be, or at least most everybody is going to be in one spot. And in those cases, they will bring you out to an event to shoot their staff. And in those cases, you'll shoot 150, 200, 250 people. But I really classify those as event headshots rather than large companies. So there are two different ways event headshots typically work. The first is that it's an internal sales conference and you're photographing all of the staff for that sales co for that company that's putting on the sales conference. The other is the expo. So when you're having a big show, like one of the jobs I shoot is for the National Kitchen and Bath Association, and they have one of the biggest conferences in the country every year, and they bring us out. And they will have a sponsor pay for us to do this. And we will just be running a headshot booth where they hire us out for the whole day or multiple days. And anybody who's at the event is more than welcome to just come up and get a headshot. It's basically like a photo booth at a wedding, but for professional headshots. And the reason that they do this, this adds experience. It adds value to the event. Much like, you know, in, in, and it also brings people into, let's say, a particular trade show booth. So if I go shoot for Bloomberg at, at their women in tech conference and they hire me to come out and let's say one of their sponsors of the show, let's say one of their sponsors is Microsoft. And so Microsoft is paying for us to be a, a headshot station that's in the Microsoft area. It's just a way to get people to come into their booth and interact with Microsoft. Much like if you go to smaller conventions, you always seem like sometimes they have like a magician doing tricks to get you to come to the trade show booth and stuff like that. It's just that. But it's also really great lead generation. Yes. Because we collect contact information from everybody we photograph. So we're able to provide the person that hired us with a really good list of leads. And we also are able to distribute those photos on their behalf, making their life a lot easier. But so those are the three main areas of, of team headshot photography. You mm -hmm. got your small teams, you got your medium to kind of large teams, and then you've got event-based headshot photography, which has uh, s internal sales conference. And underneath that is also uh, experiential kind of expo photography. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the bulk that those are the different categories of team headshots in our, in our studio. And that's mm -hmm. team headshots brings in about, 60 percent of our of our annual gross is mm -hmm. doing team headshots so let me jump into the retouching because um based what i understood you outsource retouching process right for so teams how... almost always individuals i do some myself but yeah okay. i outsource most of my retouching these days so i'm guessing this is like a really fast retouching process or this is like any what, like what is your approach to that because i like you know i'm, I'm guessing like the lighting is it's, it's the main thing to get stuff right right over like you know flat lighting whatever so you don't have to play with a lot of those crazy right stuff. i'm not you know for events and large teams mm -hmm. i'm very rarely shooting something as contrast or dynamic as you mm -hmm. would produce for your individual clients for example and i love to shoot dramatic i like to shoot precise oh, right. but this yeah. is not the venue for that because yeah. you're going to get somebody with a big wide head and a big nose mm -hmm. then you're going to get somebody with a narrow face and a tiny button nose and somebody with a big forehead and each one of those people you would adjust 
your lighting for each one of those people if they were coming individually in your studio. Well, you wouldn't do the same thing for everybody. To the outside person, it might look like your lighting is the same, but in fact, you have to do quite a bit to make that style of lighting look good on a different shaped face. So mm -hmm. I have to create lighting that makes as many different types of faces look good as possible. Mm -hmm. And that is a really low contrast lighting ratio, mm -hmm. usually something like, I wouldn't even call it a two to one. I'd call it more like a one and a half to one mm -hmm. with sort of a sense of directional light and, and with a big light source. I'm usually using something like a 60 inch parabolic umbrella and an arc mm -hmm. light reflector or some kind of reflector around the, the side and the bottom. And the mm -hmm. idea is just to create the softest, most pleasing light possible and to nail the exposure in camera to, to make the light as flattering as I can to different types of complexions. And so what, and then they'll come into the, you know, shoot tethered into the computer and I will have a capture one style or a preset you call it in Lightroom that will kind of tweak it a little bit to, to reduce contrast in the, some places and others and shadow and highlight control uh, to make everything look a little smoother and nicer. And then mm -hmm. that is what the person sees when they select their images. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to give them as close to an actual retouch as I possibly can, but that's all happening in, in, in the preset. Now, when they choose it, I do send it off and there are lots of great editing services I recommend. Mm -hmm. um, mo the one I use the most right now is retouchup.com. Now, mm -hmm. any editing service has its issues. You know, you're going to get ones you're going to have to send back again and that, that happens. But once you've got it dialed in, like you know the editors that work for that company that you like, um, I've even had specific instructions permanently put into the notes on my account so that you know and know most of the time and, and and then and it's just a basically a light natural retouch it removes blemishes dark circles under the eyes stray hairs and if the eyes and teeth are yellow or the eyes are red we have them remove that never brightening the eyes never brightening the teeth just taking the yellow and red out of them um and most and if you you can manage almost everything else in camera using a lint roller to get stuff mm -hmm. off their shirt making sure ties are straight you know so it becomes a process of getting it 95 percent of the way there when you take the picture and then sending it off and making the retouching services job as easy as you possibly can like you should get it back from the retouching service and go what did they do and you should have to pull up the original to see the difference like that's mm -hmm. how light of a retouch we we like just everybody looking we call it beautiful but believable is is the yeah. style and so um, that's this kind of retouching we do for teams. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't go crazy into, you know, uh, sculpting, shadow highlight sculpting or, or uh, depth of definitions or color grading in any particular way. You have to understand, I think, going into it, like how the images are going to get used. And mm -hmm. do you know the number one thing, how these images get used when I take large teams? It's, I don't know, social media platforms? Nope websites nope it is email signatures okay so when i'm shooting for like i give them over to the company and the company gives them to it and they go on to their their outlook server yeah. and they just put a little tiny headshot into each person's profile and then mm -hmm. everybody gets a new email signature the people who i photograph don't even usually get the images so sometimes they okay. go into websites, sometimes they go into LinkedIn, but by and large, more than half of these images are only really going to be used as an email signature or a chat icon in their Microsoft Teams. Okay. And so like understanding that, like there's no point in going in and retouching the eyelashes on an image that's going to be 50 pixels across. Yeah. And so one of the things when we onboard with a client, when we, when we do the discovery process with them, is we find out how the images are going to be used. And we always adjust our technique a little bit depending. So if they're like, these are each employee is, gets a huge, gets a page on the website with the image huge across the top, then it's okay. Then we need to approach this with a slightly different level of retouching. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's like, this is just, everybody's going to get a LinkedIn photo and an email signature photo, then a nice light retouch with great lighting and expression are just going to be more than enough to get the mm -hmm. job done. And so we use retouch up for most of the volume retouching. We have the editors that we like dialed in. So we request, request specific editors and, uh, and they usually are able to turn around as many as like 150 headshots in a day or two. Wow. Okay. That's, that sounds interesting. Um, so, so did you guys have any issues, let's say with clients who are not happy with their shots? Like, because I'm, I'm guessing there is always some kind of black sheep 
Oh, yeah. dude, you know there is. Come on, I'm not gonna let no everybody I photograph loves <laughs> their pictures because I'm amazing. No, dude, like <laughs> the, the here here's the thing you have to realize when you're shooting boutique portrait photography and you're sort of cradling the the tender psyche of the people and and you're really giving them the 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 long and beautiful experience and you're giving them the the IPS sessions and then the whole nine yards. Like you have the opportunity to sort of help people come to trust you and feel good about what you're doing for them. People mm -hmm. carry so much baggage into self-image. It's, it's unbelievable. And photographers, because we're mostly just insecure, creative narcissists, we always mm -hmm. take it personally when somebody doesn't like our photos. Mm -hmm. And so like we create these long processes in order to gain trust. And, and really if somebody loves you and believes in you as an artist, it's almost like the emperor's new clothes. They're just going to love the photos, you know, if you do it. But that's always still not always the case. I have about 60 seconds with someone in front of my camera a lot of times. And then they walk right over to the laptop and look at their photos immediately without me doing anything to them. And so what I have to do is develop a little bit of a thicker skin because you're just going to get like, and God bless it, I'm not picking on anybody, but you're going to get the really heavy people with no neck. You're going to get the, the plastic surgery gone wrong person. You're going to get the person who showed up in a life's a beach tank top and is missing three teeth. You're just, you're going to get people with unreasonable expectations of beauty. You absolutely are. That's just in, it, it's just impossible to avoid. But if you, I would say that probably about 90 to 95% of the people that I photograph in the situations where I'm shooting maybe a hundred or more people, I'd say 90 to 95% are satisfied with their picture. And, and I'd say that's really good. I, I think a hundred's not possible. It, with Once you get those numbers, you're just going to get, and you're going to get somebody who's having a bad day. Like I photographed a guy and he was being such a pain in the butt, you know, and I was like, what is this guy's deal? And it turns out his husband had just died from COVID, you oh. know, like, like that's not on me, man. Like, I don't, you don't know what's in their head. Like, you just got to be kind. You got to be like as empathetic as you possibly can. And you just do your best. And mm -hmm. if somebody's not satisfied, like uh, uh, it's usually pretty easy. I'd say v I can get almost anybody to be at least fine with the picture. Like, you know, I really the like the, the concept that you letting people choose their photo, right? Because that's oh, kind yeah. of little, you're just pushing a little bit responsibility on them. Well, that that helps too because you know, very often it happens that they don't like any of the ones that I show them. That yeah. happens from time to time. That's not an uncommon thing. And so I'll go. You know what? Let's. This is my. This is my dialogue. Okay, I say I totally understand because this is kind of a rushed fast food headshot situation. So mm -hmm. let me do this. I'd love the opportunity to take a few more, but I want you to look at these and I want you to tell me what specific things that you want to do differently. Because in this situation, I'm going to have the same lights and the same camera and the same everything. And so we need to get a different result. And I just, could you tell me, look at these and don't just say, I don't like them. Please mm -hmm. tell me what specifically you don't like. And half the time they go, it's just that wrinkle in my shirt. It's just bothering me. And you go, shit, man, I got that. I'll Photoshop that wrinkle out in two seconds. And they'll go, really? Go, yeah. Then, then I love it. And you're like, what the yeah. hell, man? Like, what the hell? And then, and sometimes they'll go, you know, I just don't think I look comfortable. I'd be like, okay, let's do this. Jump back in there. We'll take a few more shots. And I want you to just really swing for the fences because I want you to love this as much as we can possibly get you to love it. So your expression, I know we just met but your expression is going to be important. So I want you to pretend like I'm somebody you really love and then give me something amazing. And all you have to do is do that for one frame and then we'll have it. And then they get back up there, they do it and they look at it and they'll go, oh, that's much better. Thank you. And it takes 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they'll give you something specific like I'm not really feeling good about how my hair looks. Tell me. And then they tell you and then you fix it and you take up more. Or some people are just control freaks and they need to... Ugh, they need to just put their little thumbprint on it. So they'd be yeah. like, actually, I was thinking that maybe, maybe that I'll like button my jacket. And then, and, and what I would like to do is I'd like to turn this way and to lift my chin. And you go like, sure, 
absolutely. Let's do that. Then they jump back in. I take the photos. They direct themselves and then they come back and they go, oh, that's much better. It isn't. But, you know, I'll go, oh, good. I'm so glad you're happy. Like, I don't take it personally because it's not about me. I'm good at what I do. I'm good with people. I'm good at directing people. And I am viciously good about finding someone's best angle and expression fast. My superpower isn't photography. My superpower is people. I can make almost anyone comfortable. I can make almost anyone look the best they can look in that situation in under 30 seconds. It is a very strange superpower that works nowhere else in the world except in that one situation. But it is my superpower. And so... And I've been able to develop this superpower by not getting my feelings hurt and realizing when someone doesn't like a picture of themselves, either it's got nothing to do with me or there is something that I can do to listen and serve them. I don't consider myself an artist that's serving them up pearls that they have to swallow. You know, I, I, I listen. I'm empathetic and I go, tell me. And then I collaborate with them. A good collaboration isn't bad. Not every good idea has to be mine. And if they don't like the way that I do the shoulder dip or whatever, that is my customary way of doing things. I listen to them, tell me, and then I, and then I adjust with them and they'll either, it'll either be better because they'll be happier or more comfortable, or they'll at least think it's better and then they're happy and then it's done. So mm -hmm. like you got to get your ego out of the way. You got to genuinely like people at, or, or at least be able to pretend to like people uh, for extended periods of time. And, you know, you have to be willing to collaborate. I mean, it's your most of the time your reason for being mad at them for being picky is because, dude, it's just your email signature. And then, you know, so their their reason on the other side for me not being mad at them being mad should be it's just an email signature. Why are you getting mad? You know, like <laughs> this isn't great art. Let's just make a good email signature photo together. So it's just being calm being kind listening and the problem is is that you have when you're shooting high volume you have to listen you have to be calm and kind to take the high road 300 times a day and mm -hmm. so but i find that the vast majority of people are easy to work with are grateful for your help and and and, and most of them are also just dealing with a little bit of discomfort and insecurity which it's not that hard to just go there you go and they're like oh just steady the boat a little bit by just yeah. being cool and it works out just fine. Absolutely. And I think hundred percent agree with you because I, I think the one thing what I've learned throughout, you know, shooting headshots, like you have to learn how to be patient because the patience is, is the key to, you know, deal with these people. And as you said, and I agree, and I've been dealing this again, doing headshots that it's most of the time 99 percent it's not about you it's about them because they have issues they have problems and you're exposing them to the to the world you know they look at look at themselves and then you know they they see all this pain and that's when you know this whole thing kind of get triggered and all of a sudden you know they blame you for the way they look and then it, it, it's i think when we kind of will be done with you know headshots we can become like you know really good psychologists and we can yeah. kind of open our offices how many times do people just tell you the craziest stuff in your headshot oh, session they tell you the, this, the most intimate stuff sometimes it is it is and and you know like i'll just share with you quickly one story i had so i had this client uh real estate agent uh mid-age woman and the shoot went great. We had fun. I was showing her images. She basically, um, you know, really liked the, that those images. And as soon as I sent the images for, you know, the approval, and so she could pick some final shots for the editing, she just lost it. I guess that I got the nastiest email ever. She hates those photos. She basically doesn't want to use them. You know, all this, all this story. And I tried to. I call her up and I said, "Look, let's do this way." Um, show those images to your family, to your friends. And if anybody from, you know, your circle will tell you that, you know, those pictures are bad, I'll give you money back. No problem at all. So I gave her a few days. You know, she called me back, apologized. Like, you know what? Everybody loves those pictures. And then she started telling me this whole story about her divorce and, you know, all the shit what was happening in her life. And I'm yeah. just like, you know, I was like, okay, now, now I get it why you have so many issues. But what I found what is fascinating in this whole story is the fact that, you know, how you react to this, right? Because I could blow up, be mad at her, just tell her something, which I probably would regret. 
But because, you know, I was patient and then I was just kind of tried to take it easy and try to kind of dive deeper, just solve the problem. And she's returning the client right now. You know, she's coming right. back. Yeah. I, you know what? It's a brilliant example because, you know, I always tell people no matter what is causing the problem in the session, it doesn't have to be your fault to be mm -hmm. your problem. It, I'm st yeah. I still have to deal with it. And, and the minute that you even justifiably react emotionally mm -hmm. to a client, you lose. Because yes. even if you're even being right doesn't do anything in this situation. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you how many times just taking a beat and listening or being patient or even waiting a few days for someone to come back and they're just, they're, they calm down. You know, especially mm -hmm. the last couple of years, man, haven't we all been dealing with so much stress like the last couple of years, it's just people yelling at each other in the streets and on the internet and everybody's just got a cause that they're willing to die on a hill for. And like people's family members are sick and dying and everybody takes everything just so seriously. And then like everybody's polarized all the time and sometimes with good reason, but like there's a, enough out there without the headshot session, stressing somebody the hell out, you know? And I, there was a guy who came into my studio and it was very hard to read. I can almost always get somebody to just chill out and have fun with me almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And this guy just would not budge. And he was just not saying a word, would give me nothing. And then like, I just, I was reading vibes off him. I was like, he's not uncomfortable. This guy's hurting, you know? And so mm -hmm. I, 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 I said, man, are you okay? And he goes, ah. He goes, he starts crying. He's like, he's like, I'm not. He goes, he's like, I was up all night with my son. My, my 17 year old son just got cut from the, the baseball team, varsity baseball. He's like, baseball is his life. It's, it's, he wants to play baseball in college. It's the only thing he cares about. And he just got completely cut from the team. He said, I've been up all night crying with my son. And we, we spent 30 minutes just talking about that. And this was in like a 10 minute corporate matching headshot session, like somebody that's supposed to be in and out. And, and we, and then finally, you know, we got 30 minutes in and we bonded and I gave him some eye drops and we got him some headshots. But like, you know, empathy is is the portrait photographer's secret weapon. Uh, it will always get you farther. And sometimes people are unreasonable, but I have yet to run into, you know, more than one client in 200 that can't be reasoned with eventually if you don't react to them. And so, and, and other people may have had a different experience and I get that, but I photograph a lot of people and sometimes I don't have time to just be kept in empathy, but you know, because it's a 60 seconds a person, but like it really doesn't take much to just, mm -hmm. you just have to take your perspective around and go like, this isn't about me. They're not upset because of me. They, they, they don't, they're not, they don't dislike the pictures because of me. Like a lot of times there's something else going on. And in about 95% of those cases, you can just put a steady hand on the, on the edge of the, the canoe and, 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 and everything will be okay. It's just, you have to be good with better with people than you are with the camera is what I like to say. And, uh, and I am. And that's, and I try to be, and it doesn't mean I don't want to throat punch somebody every once in a while. Cause certainly I do. But ultimately, those outbursts, those reactions are followed by a lot of like guilt and shame because, you know, you only made things worse. And so uh, it helps you it help becoming a better photographer in this respect can help actually help you become a better person. I think like the exposure oh. to so many people and everybody's going through something, you know, um, and I don't believe in in shocking or berating or, you know, you never know what somebody's going through. I always like to say you got to match their energy and whatever energy somebody comes in with, you have to give them the energy that they need to get them where they're going to go. So if somebody comes in and they're really like keyed up and they're like, <laughs> then I come at them really chill. Yeah. And I, and then we meet in the middle and then, then we're like both a little bouncy, but, but everybody's good. If somebody comes in and they're really like, yeah, then I come at them with a little more excitement and, and let my excitement get them excited a little bit. But sort of like there is nothing that works on every person. You know, you have to be you have to be empathetic. You have to listen and you have to respond the best way you can in, the, in being the most human you can. I think photographers are so very often selfish 
and we're takers and we like to take images and please ourselves, create art for ourselves. You're just a person who is the subject of my art and this pleases me. And I think that you can be a great photographer that way. I don't think you can be a great portraitist that way. I don't think you can create meaningful, iconic work that way. I think you can create beautiful portraits, but not great, iconic, meaningful portraits without a human connection. And so I think that, and that works in speed. When you have 50, 100 people back to back, it's just staying calm, realizing it's not about you, trying to respond as best you can, and always take the, take the angle that that person might be going something, going through something, and it's got nothing to do with you. And don't let stuff hurt your feelings. Just because, you know, they don't like your picture doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. <laughs> doesn't yeah. mean they're a bad person. Doesn't mean they're trying to be difficult. It just means that, okay, what do we do now? Just like I asked them, give me something specific. And I'm going to give you, if you're having a problem with a client and they're not liking their picture, be like, okay, what specifically can you do to help them through this? Because they have to pick a picture and you have to shoot the next person. So how can we, how can we work this out with them? What do they need? Give them what they need listen to them, give them what they want. Even if it's to let the baby have their bottle and then move on. Like it's just, I it just, I just don't get my feelings hurt anymore. People ask, Oh, that must be a nice camera or, Oh, and when they do this face, Oh, I don't know. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I don't like it at all. And you're like, okay, uh, thanks. I, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. That's not helpful just to say you don't like it. It's okay for you not to like it. But what would help me give you a picture that you do like is to give me a specific thing you don't like. And if like, I just don't like any of it, then you're like, all right, okay, fine. Yeah. You know, that happens sometimes. Just yeah. let that one, let that one go, you yeah. know? But uh, that's, it's just being human, being, trying to be em empathetic, trying to be kind and getting outside of your ego. When volume photography, you can't have any ego in it. You really can't because yeah. when you're shooting some kind of volume sports team, some eight-year-old is going to come up and, just give you the worst insult of your life. Just say the one thing that you're the most sensitive about. Like, hey, man, how come your nose is so big? Like, <laughs> you know, like just you just got to take yourself out of the equation when you're shooting volume and just do your best. So let's switch the gears. And I just want to talk a little bit. Who inspire you? Um, do you have any mentors? Do you have some some photographers you're looking up to? Um, I watched one of your YouTube videos where you actually just named a couple photographers, headshot photographers. Oh, I did like the, the yeah, that, that, that was really, a clickbaity ass video, wasn't it? It was like yeah. the five best headshot photographers. Like, yeah. And I was reading some crazy. comments was kind of funny because you actually mentioned one, one company ours was, I think it was a couple and they were also were doing uh, the big volume. Dave and Catherine Kalmbach. Yeah. In, yes. uh, One tree studios in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And people are just going crazy about it. I'm just like, you know, he, <laughs> You want to talk about a guy, a, a, a power couple like Dave and Catherine, my God, like you want to see 300 people in about six hours, get the best headshot they've ever had in their life. That'll be Dave wow. and Catherine. Like they do. I don't think anybody I've ever seen does volume headshot photography better than the two of them. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's not <laughs> super flashy because it's literally just turn and burn headshots. But uh, me, but with still. my particular experience, I have a soft spot for that superpower. And so mm -hmm. when I made that video, I got a lot of crap for people I didn't mention and for bringing certain people in. And every single I, I honestly, I made the video because I knew people would want to talk about it and have th yeah. and, and have thoughts. <laughs> I tried to make it very clear that these are my opinions. And that these are like the these are the criteria that I set down mm -hmm. for my list, and I'd love to hear what you think. But people just attacked my opinions, and I'm like, okay, cool, man. Like, just I do you the same thing. Your own YouTube. opinion, you have to. I know. <laughs> I do the same thing with YouTube comments that I do with volume headshot photographers. I always try to take the high road as much as I can. And when somebody leaves a nasty comment, if I'm really wanting to be a dick about it, I just go, "You seem nice." And then I hit the reply. That's it. I just reply, you seem nice. And that's it. That's, <laughs> that's, it. The, yeah. that's the nastiest I'll get, you know. Um, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, who do I look up to? God, Raffle, I've had so many incredible, incredible photographers take an interest in me and support me um, throughout my career. And I, I, there's just no way. There's just no way to, to thank everybody. Uh, a couple mm -hmm. of honorable mentions. 
Um, my parents, obviously, they uh, probably why I'm on this path. I feel like I'm giving a speech at award show. Um, and then my my first photography boss that wasn't my mom and dad, Kurt Littlecott and his partner, Stephanie Rounds, they were very instrumental and loving and supportive um, and taught me a lot of the right way to do things and uh, that photography is still cool. You know, they were really, really instrumental in inspiring me to want to go into business for myself. And um, as far as historically speaking, my favorite, mm -hmm. favorite portrait photographer is uh, probably Yusuf Karsh. I really, mm -hmm. really love his work and his approach. He was such a bright light, such a good soul. And um, his work is, if you, I mean, probably everybody has seen, maybe they don't know that he shot it. He did the very famous portrait of Winston Churchill that is on the money in England. So like, that's his, <laughs> that's his uh, but he's photographed everybody from like, you know, the queen and Muhammad Ali all the way. Every, anybody you've ever heard of that was famous all the way up until like 1990, I think when he died, he's photographed every celebrity you've ever heard of pretty much movie stars, athletes, politicians. Um, and he just was a man who loved the craft and was meticulous. And I really admire his work and his life story coming as a, um, an Armenian, a Christian Armenian refugee during the, the genocide in Armenia when his family fled as a little boy and how he ended up getting to Canada, you know, with a relative and how he started in photography and, and his whole story. I just find it very inspirational. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, his work is, is spectacular. Um, modern portrait photographers I really love. I love Sam Jones, who's really good. He's actually also a filmmaker. He just uh, directed a documentary about Tony Hawk called Till the Wheels Fall Off. That's on HBO now. He's a brilliant photographer. Um, you know, in my life personally, um, there are too many to count. I would say like many people could say, I'd say Greg Daniel from Titusville. He, he was the former president of PPA and he's been a very strong supportive influence in my life for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a lot of local photographers that were always helping each other, lending gear, referring jobs, answering questions. Um, and I have a great group of friends who I'm in, in contact with on a daily basis who, um, you know, we have our little like coworker text group. And since none of us really have coworkers, we just, bitch to each other via group text and we're really supportive and, and help each other. And so it's like, uh, you know, uh, Travis and Jed and Carol and these incredible mm -hmm. photographers, friends of mine, Savannah and Keith. And th these are like my, my photography buddies. And I would say also, um, the best thing that ever happened to me is my wife, my business partner, mm -hmm. because although she was a photographer, when we met the coolest thing that she ever did, the coolest thing about her is that she is outgoing and wickedly funny and talented and kind she's so kind and hardworking, but she has absolutely zero desire to compete for the spotlight and as you might imagine i'm chatty i'm gregarious i desperately love being around people i like being the center of attention i like you know and um, and she gets me and lets me be myself without sort of ambition or jealousy there's no competitiveness between us and she is just in her own right, this incredible creative person, but has just been the most incredible support human for me and allowing me. And the reason that I people, anybody knows who I am and that anybody follows me or is interested in anything that I'm doing is because she has made it literally made it all possible, has encouraged me at times when I wanted to quit who's given me the best ideas about the things that I should do with the ways we should take the business. And, uh, she's everything, man. And then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, uh, in this situation that I'm in without her. Um, so she's probably the most inspirational person, uh, in my life to be fair. Uh, but, uh, there, there's a laundry list of photographers. I love and admire people who've helped me out through the years. Um, uh, and I've learned, I can't tell you how much I've yeah, learned yeah, from so absolutely. many people, but yeah, those, I think those are some of the highlights that are off the top of my head right now. Perfect. Okay. So I have a few more questions for you. Um, first thing, what I want to ask you, let's jump in for a second for the business side. Cause, um, I, I think like, let's kind of, um, maybe quickly run through this. So what's in your opinion, like the best marketing strategy for headshots and i know hmm. a little bit about that's it's actually it's a pretty things. easy question to answer um okay. for headshot marketing um it is having a very good functional website mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. having a website where you can get all the information you need with a call to action and the ability to act. That would be like online booking, Zoom calls, a really strong information-based website that's very easy to navigate. Like there's just making your website amazing with great content on it. And then having that place to send people to the, the easy if headshot photography is the easiest you just google ads will just send people there i get half my mm-hmm. business comes from google and oh, wow. so you know, and so if you uh, but you can't just buy google ads and mm-hmm. expect them to work you have to have a place to send them to that converts so you need a high converting website and you need a a good strong uh, facebook ad camp or google ad campaign um with however way you decide to do it mm-hmm. You have to have, but you have to have that high functioning, high converting website and a good Google ad campaign. And that will get you really get the ball rolling on your business, but you have to do that stuff the right way. And and honestly, I could give a three hour class on just how to do that. But that to me is the, the, that's where you start to get the ball rolling, to get income going. Um, And then you can start to do things like focusing on, retaining those clients client retention is the most important thing for any business owner um, any small business owner you have to keep the clients you get as much as you possibly can it is much easier to keep a client and get their return business than it is to replace that client with a new client Mm -hmm. and the cool thing is if you're a small business owner like a photographer you've got this much bandwidth for clients there are only so many clients that you can take and serve well, right? But most of us are operating well below our bandwidth. But if you're retaining your clients, every time you get a few more clients, over the after a few years, you're going to be operating really close to your full bandwidth just with returning clients. And, and then you don't have to spend so much time and money acquiring new ones. And clients that are that loyal will also continue to send you new people. So starting to get clients in the door with a great high converting website, a viciously effective Google ad campaign, and focus all of your marketing energy uh, in, 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 on keeping the clients that you get. Photography mm-hmm. is a small business with a slow growth curve. And that means that you're not necessarily, it's usually most photographers I know, it's around year six or seven before their business has critical mass, you know, before you cross that tipping point, somewhere between year five and year seven. If you're out there and you've been doing it for three years and you ha- and, and you're still struggling, that's fine. That's normal. You, mm-hmm. you, it's learning best practices, putting them into motion. And that stuff doesn't start to pay dividends usually for a good long time. So I, mm-hmm. my experience is the average is about five to seven years for that tipping point to where you can pay yourself every week to where you're putting money into your retirement to where you're not having to beat the bushes on a daily basis to bring business into your studio. Um, and so retention, Google, and then if you've got still room in your life for more bandwidth other than that, you could reach out to more traditional marketing efforts like community marketing, charity events, headshot mini sessions, chamber of commerce, all those kinds of things. And all of those other things that you're doing will give you stuff to be posting about on your social media channels, which I think is sort of padding your marketing efforts. But um, first things first, your website has to be tight and it has to work and it has to function and it has to convert. Your website should be like a, a ride at Disney World. Where does every ride at Disney World dump you off? In the damn gift shop. Your website has to dump the person in the gift shop and convert them. You have to ask for their business. You have to give them a button that they can push to give you their money. You have to take their money. You have to give them incredible service and then spit them out the other side with their Mickey ears on going, I can't wait to go back next year. Yeah. That's how your business has to run. Well, boy, you got to make it happen yeah. just like that. And so... Um, That's a great advice. focus on retaining those clients more than getting new ones. As you get mm-hmm. clients, put your energy into to bringing them back in again, to keeping in touch with them, to making it easy to work with you again. Um, especially those corporate teams onboarding new higher headshots are just like a license to print money. So, mm-hmm. you know, you make it easy for people to keep sending all of their employees to you, find ways to do that. And um, everything else in a headshot business, I think, 
at least in the way that I do it, is kind of secondary to that. Google and retention is everything. And if you use Google and retention, you will hit your bandwidth. Now, there are plenty of other things that you can do. You can go on LinkedIn and mine for information. That works great. You can advertise on Facebook and Instagram. You can spend all your time making YouTube videos and, gr and grow an audience. Or There are a zillion ways to market your business. Mm -hmm. But for headshots, people, for corporate headshots, People are looking to cross that off their list of to-dos. I need a new headshot for the website. Just like that. That's what people do when they order a pizza or call a tow truck or whatever. They type in Google and they go, I need a pizza or pizza by Winter Park or wherever they live. And then they go, okay, that place? No, that place? No. Ooh, that place looks good. Look at that website. Look at the pictures of that pizza. Prices are great. Bang, order a pizza. Mm -hmm. That's how people shop for headshots. They just need to get it off their list. Not all people, but a lot. And, and team headshots especially, that person who's been tasked with finding a headshot photographer is just looking to cross a thing off their list. So make sure they can. Make it easy for them to cross it off their list. And uh, – that's about all I got on that subject so Perfect. far. I could go into it for three hours if you want. I you know I have that kind of time. <laughs> so my last question is, what would be one advice uh, you would give to a hatchet photographer who is just entering this industry? Go to dental school. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I would Straightforward. Say no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> that's just a joke I use a lot. Um, okay. Photography. That's a good one. This is my, this is my advice. <laughs> photography is a really wonderful hobby. It is a brilliant and, and wonderful art form that makes a lot of people happy. Most of those people that it makes really happy don't do it for a living. So beware of the idea that doing something that you currently enjoy, turning that into your job, beware of the idea that that's going to make you happy because it won't. Because let's say that you're really successful and you get busy and overworked and stressed out. Now you're going to hate photography. Now let's say that you start a business and you're really bad at running a business and you run yourself, run it into the ground and now you hate photography. So like protect your love of photography by running a really good business. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to protect your love of photography is to run a really good, smart business and if you succeed without overextending yourself without burning out you will always be able to hold on to how much you enjoy photography that's the best advice i got perfect thank you gary so much for your advice uh your teaching um all this fantastic information i've I'm was it too much that... did i do too much no 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 i think you did great you know what we could talk probably for hours dude i i want to pick your brain i should be i should interview you on my podcast that's sure. what i should do you yeah. know just let me know when and i will be more than happy to join your podcast and yeah i'm tired of the sound of my voice i want to hear about you man absolutely we can definitely do that okay right so on. just tell me when and i'm gonna be on it no problem at all I appreciate you having me. Thanks, Ralph, man. Oh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I will add all your information so people can find you. I highly recommend it um, to everyone to check your podcast, check your YouTube channel. There is uh, so many great um, informations there. Um, everything is related to business and headshots. So like every video has so much value. It's just crazy. So everyone has to check this out. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best because I know you have a baby coming up any soon. day now. Like I'm, I'm going on paternity now. leave as soon okay. as I get off this this call with you. I'm on paternity leave for the next three weeks. Absolutely. So you're taking some time off, or oh yeah, yeah. I've got th three weeks, maybe a month. I haven't decided yet. It's going to depend on how things go with the baby. But the baby's due next week, so I, oh, okay. I've, I've got I've got one session left to process. Then I'm out like trout, man. I'm out of here. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so thank you so much. We'll be in touch. And um, thank you again for, for this, this interview. No problem, man. Thanks for having me.